Well, thank you for that introduction, Christoph. Thank you uh, to the Rachel, Car Rachel Carson Center, uh, the fellows, the staff especially, uh, the directors for this opportunity. Um, it's been a long time coming. I first received a fellowship in 2014 and it took me three years to get here. So thank you for being patient with me. Um, and I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, this presentation today represents an early stage in an experiment in form um, that is informed by years of archival and field research, in this case in Montana, um, that convinced me that I needed to think a little bit differently about to how to convey the role of the land in the story of homesteading. Um, so uh, slightly contrary to what Christoph suggested this is both a 19th and a 20th century history and I'll get to that towards the end but in fact the largest impacts of the American homesteading process took place in the 20th century and not in Kansas or Nebraska which is where I originally thought that the impacts were greatest but in fact um, in places like Montana and North Dakota. So um, the premise of this presentation actually fits in pretty nicely with the earlier presentations today insofar as I'm really interested in the specificity of place and the role of uh, people in uh, influencing ideas about spatial theory and um, and the role of nature in affecting human experience. But I wanted to step away from a human history as I was trying to situate the nature of these places that I'm writing about. And so just a brief introduction. This book is a, um, is a spatially oriented history of homesteading that takes the broad scope of migration under the terms of the 1862 and subsequent Homestead Acts through 1986 when homesteading ended in Alaska. Um, and so the idea is I want to both capture the environmental dynamism, the local ecological dynamism of the places that were most altered by homesteading and then capture the human experience on that one place, in this case a 260 hectare uh, section of land or a one square mile section of land. But I'm looking to write that natural history a little bit differently. So I'm thinking of this in terms of a lyric essay rather than uh, a natural history. And so I'm going to actually be reading parts of this essay over the course of the rest of my presentation. But what I'm seeking to do is to recapture some of the sensory dynamism of the, these places. And so I'm writing about Montana in the 19 teens, uh, the state of North Dakota in the 19 aughts, uh, Oklahoma at the turn of the 20th century and Kansas in the 1870s, all places where there were these big spikes of successful migrations um, onto free homesteads, free public lands. And so essentially all of these places, unfortunately, um, for me, quantitatively, I was really interested in getting a, a picture from different biomes, but homesteading didn't really affect the Great Basin in any significant way. It didn't affect uh, the Southwest. And so the places that were most influenced by this process were all up and, oops, wah, whoa, okay, all up and down the Great Plains biome. So this area in, um, Hold on, am I going to get this right? On the top. Great. Turn it around. Ah. Okay, so I. The orange. Okay. Okay, whoops. All right, so I thought I was experimenting right before. Okay. There we go. Okay, excuse me. Technological, I got it. Okay, so this area here in orange. <laughs> Um, but I'm also interested in the ways in which the government understood this space, the U.S. federal government understood this space, and so I've been mapping, um, co compiling a set of, um, of U.S. Geological Survey maps of the most uh, arid and semi-arid lands in the West and trying to understand how those ideas about what was feasible and natural um, in this place um, ended up playing out in policy terms and also um, in the context of settlement patterns. So bear with me and bear with the bees if you will please. So Wallace Stegner, a child of the Great Plains of the American West, reflected on the sensations that punctuated his childhood in southern Saskatchewan. 
He wrote, that country is notable primarily for its weather, which is violent and prolonged, its emptiness, which is almost frighteningly total, and its wind, which blows all the time in a way to stiffen your hair and rattle the eyes in your head. So if you follow the course of the wind uh, 100 miles southeast, you would alight in Tampico, Montana, which is located right around here which is a place that few artists uh, emerged from, but which, like Segner's native white mud, had its land rush and recovered. The homesteading boom and bust in, uh, on the northern plains left uh, striking landscapes in its wake, even as roots continue to absorb plows and rot brings down the last frame shacks among the undulating hills. This was the iconic American landscape, stretching as far as the eye could see, Oops. And uh, populated with herds of bison, hundreds of thousands strong, pronghorn, elk, prairie dogs, and beaver in prolific quantities. These all defied the imagination, and yet today there is no trace of these creatures. The Great Plains had no monumental mountains, nor raging rivers, but rather a truly unexpected vastness that etched itself into the minds of generations of travelers. On a day when the wind is high, you can hear nothing but, this, but its sound. And so I wanted to explore what this place was and what a small region in the endangered Great Plains has to tell us about environmental change. And I wanted to find a way to make sense of what is essentially a series of curated photographs of an unfamiliar place to most of you, I suspect. Today I want to use the methods of sensory history to capture the diversity of experience and to experiment with both form and point of view. I will also be focusing in on one square mile of this landscape, seeking to convey the detail that resident creatures experience. So how might we, oh gracious, <laughs> how might we tell this, best tell the story of a place positioned at 48.3 latitude, negative 106.76 longitude, elevation 2170 or 661 meters. A place that was surveyed in 1891 to create township 30 north, 38 east, of the Montana Meridian and specifically the southwestern part of section 36. Let's see if I can do this right. Here we go. Which is the place I'm talking about. This place was settled by a woman named Lily B. Stearns in 1912 and she proved up her homestead over the course of five years and she is the second part of my Montana story and you will hear more about her uh, later this summer for sure, those of you who are, are in residence at this Carson Center. What might these coordinates, both ge geographical and governmental, tell us? And I've been exploring this idea for the better part of the last year, because they don't tell us pretty much anything, other than to how to find this place on a certain kind of map. On the Great Plains, the inconstancy of weather and the micro-associations of plants and their resident creatures means that while it's possible to paint a landscape with a really broad brush, the acre by acre reality of one 640 acre uh, section as opposed to another is pretty determinative. Oops, there we go. Okay, I will go. I will get this down eventually. What is going on? Okay, there we go. Oof. Okay, we are really not having a very good time here. <laughs> okay. Um, so I have been working to compile or generate a bee's eye view that captures the landscape at nearly the ground level. My protagonist is one of the keystone species on these grasslands, the bee, a creature that experiences the cadences of nature that others might miss, the diversity of landforms, the floral and faunal inhabitants, the power of the wind and the rain. Unlike a bird's eye view, which combines landforms, the built environment, and a somewhat flexible sense of scale, I want to get a lot closer to the land. And to additionally uh, create complexity, our bee doesn't really see very much, but her remaining senses give us volumes of information about her home, and so we're going to explore this region today through her myopic eyes. 
So a range of different types of uh, apodean families pollinate these lands, and prairie bumblebees work alongside miner, carpenter, leaf cutter, and mason bees to do the business of pollination on the plains. These are creatures of very specific habitats by both nature and inclination. And even though they are capable of traveling long distances, they tend to be very limited to local sites, which matches the scale of my talk today pretty nicely. Now those of you with any entomological tendencies know already that the premise of a bee's eye view is really deceptive. Because bee, while bees have five eyes, sight is their weakest sense. Um, the combination of three ocelli, which are simple eyes that discern light intensity with two large compound eyes to detect movement, provides an impressionistic perspective. And which is perfect, again, for me, because my idea is to gather visual as well as tactile information about what makes these grasslands so captivating. This is, of course, flyover country, this part of Montana, not the mountains. These are places that most people don't see the value of getting out of their car and looking at more closely. And what I've discovered in my time there is that there is an incredible amount of nuance in these most uh, overlooked American landscapes. So most of the native uh, species of the bees on the Great Plains are also solitary creatures working as lone agents, although some of them live in condo-like developments um, within inches of each other, in fact, with solitary nests. And so they're making their way on their own in this sometimes hostile place. So what I'm able to see through my own eyes, the bee experiences primarily through its sense of taste and touch. I can admire the rolling hills with their flowers and grasses and sages, and I'm going to share some of these images. But I can't share with you the taste of the chokecherry bush berries or the sound of the driving wind or the piercing feel of the grasses from over 8,000 kilometers away. I'll do my best with the help of these natives. So the plains of the northeastern Montana are full of hidden secrets, and there are gentle hills endlessly curving to the horizon, and yet little topographic detail in this corner of the world, <laughs> comparatively, although it's not quite as flat as Kansas, and Kansas is actually not the flattest of all the American states, just for the record. <laughs> Mounds of low hillocks pile upon each other, blending almost imperceptibly with the vast expanses of rolling plains, and so these grasslands present often an endless looking vista. Wind, terrain, and water all manipulate the textures of this landscape, and the clarity of the sky highlights the diversity within the boundless uh, oceans of grass. So this part of Montana was engulfed within the Kuwaitan ice sheet at its glacial maximum, and the ice stretched some 40 miles south of the Milk River, which I'm focusing on today, to the Missouri. And it's here that we're narrowing our focus on this small section just north of the Missouri, or Missouri, uh, excuse me, Milk River. Now the presence of the Rocky Mountains is felt even here, 300 miles or almost 500 kilometers to their east, in the leeward rain shadow, which both alters the weather and the winds. The region rests firmly on the low end of the semi-arid scale with an average of between 25 and 38 centimeters, or 10 to 15 inches of rain. And over the course of a 30-year period in the late 20th century, this, the area right around the Milk River um, received about 10.7 uh, inches, or, 22, or 27 centimeters of precipitation each year. And when rain comes to this part of the plains, it comes in dramatic form. Quick and severe thunderstorms that race across the sky, delivering a brief burst of heavy rain to one section, one even quarter section, while depriving the adjoining land of any moisture at all. Vast thunderheads presage, presage the coming storm, but accumulation is as unreliable as the storm's path. Now these plains thunderstorms brought terror to the people who were crossing the plains in a, on a, with a travoy or with, on horseback or just walking across or on a, um, on a uh, wagon of some sort um, with their roaring winds and booming thunder breaking ahead. But these plains thunderstorms also brought welcome rain which helped to make this semi-arid continental landscape livable, not only for the humans who made it their home over the course of millennia, but also for the insects and plants upon which these humans always relied. 
So seasons ex exercise an outsized power in this land of grasses. And contrary to many travelers' descriptions of unchanging, dull expanses, this is a place that seizes every opportunity. Now, this is a fall shot, kind of washed out. You can see that this is like the dull plains that people describe. And yet this place blossoms at the slightest provocation and fades to tonal shades when the rains pass. The profile of the grasses in the landscape shifts when the rain comes. In some years, the, rain, the green lasts well into the fall, where others find July and August with dormant grasses that have already given up on the year. The insects also rely on these seasonal changes as to the, as to the mammals that live there and the birds, frankly. And over half of the 4,600 species of North American bees actually time their emergence to the, uh, to the flowering of their preferred foods. And so there's this incredible complexity of these natural systems that biologists have only really begun to study in any detail over the course of the last 15 years. And so a 19, or 2000 biological survey that was conducted here reported that this was one of the most biologically intact landscapes on the Great Plains, and yet nobody had actually noticed that until this point, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. When rain is scarce and water supplies are far distant, the challenges of climate prove unyielding, especially for species like bees with a range sometimes of only a few hundred meters. And compounding these challenges, one ecologist playfully explained, many of the bees who populate these plains are actually single parents, single moms. And he says, life isn't easy for these single mom bees. They have to gather food for themselves and their kids while fighting off overly enthusiastic males with only one thing on their minds. When they aren't finding food, they are building and provisioning baby rooms or sitting vigilantly at the entrance of the burrow, defending it from marauding wasps or other threats. Now, as you'll see later this summer, I, as I present my work in progress on Lily Stearns, uh, my Montana homesteader, the parallels to the lives of single women homesteaders are uncanny. Now, the ecologist anthropomorphized, I didn't. I claim that as my cover here. So the Great Plains Shortgrass Prairie Province, I will get to this at the end, by the end, is it like the plains of Asia, a steppe. And what looks to be a homogenous blanket of grasses, which it looks like from this picture, is actually a diverse mixture of cool season grasses mixed with drought tolerant warm season grasses like blue grama grass, speckled with plains forbs, flowering plants, um, and uh, sages. These species that flower, the choke cherry, service berry, goldenrod, and blazing star, brighten the season stretching from April through September. And while a botanist might thrill at the descriptions of plains, cottonwood, woods, wo western snowberry, silver sagebrush, thick pike, wheatgrass, green needlegrass, western wheatgrass, and tufted hairgrass mosaics, most of us find these uh, descriptions of plant associations less compelling than the role that these plants actually played in luring vast herds of bison and pronghorns to these rolling terrains, and of course the cattle and sheep that still graze there today. Um, and so the livestock angle on this landscape is one that I won't be touching much on today, but of course is an important feature of the ecological history of this place. Descriptions of the sounds of the plains often primarily feature the intensity of animal noises, and one homesteader captured the intensity of the oral landscape by describing the calls of the coyote, which she explained were, were, were eerie, hair-rising cries that traveled so far over the open prairie and seemed so near, a wild, desolate cry with an uncannily human quality. That mournful sound is as much a part of the prairie as the wind that blows unchecked over the vast stretches, the dreary, unescapable voice of the plains. Now other sounds, of course, are lost for now and possibly forever. The historical soundscape punctuated by rumbling herds of vast bison, rum vast herds of rumbling bison, the roar of the grizzly bear and the howling of the wolves. But some of these sound marks do endure. The coyote call, as do the cries of the falcons and hawks circulating among the updrafts. Other once would be, uh, abundant species also punctuate the soundscape, and occasionally one will happen upon the cacophony of the coteries of black-tailed prairie dogs, um, or other sentinel creatures like the tiger salamander, the short-horned lizard, and the boreal chorus 
frog, which all retain a presence in the Milk River's wetlands. But the intermittent buzz of insect pollinators was rarely remarked upon by, uh, by early settlers and, frankly, the people who have lived there since, too often playing an overlooked role in the Great Plains. And their exquisite attachment to place offers insights into landscape change and its cumulative effects. Moving around the understory of the prairie, other insects, including grasshoppers and crickets, true bugs and beetles and ants, all are improving soils and accelerating organic decay, providing these ecosystem services we were talking about earlier, which have been valued in various ways by conservation organizations over the last couple of decades. While their neighbors, the flies and butterflies and moths and bees and wasps, all are providing that crucial service of pollination. Neighboring Wyoming claims over 660 species of native bees. Now, Montana has not calculated those numbers in the same way, but a few hundred miles to the south of the Milk River, uh, a bee census was conducted reporting that more than 200 species cohabited in two small tracts during the early 1980s. Now, these bees are living in various places. Bumblebees nest in cavities and dead vegetation, either above ground or below ground. Others favor uh, abandoned rodent or bird nests and, or other naturally occurring openings, while still others nest in the channels of pithy stemmed plants. And others uh, build their nests, let's see if I can do this, okay, in, uh, in the muddy resins of uh, pebbles and, uh, and uh, gumbo that, uh, that cover the stream and riverbeds. What makes the particular section I'm talking about um, useful and important or desirable in the 19th and early 20th centuries was the proximity of water. And here, let's see, can I do this? We have it right here. Right here is a point in uh, the, milk, the, the Milk River which starts in Glacier and then actually moves up and then comes back down and joins the M Missouri um, a little bit east of the town of uh, Glasgow. The tiny tributaries of the river break the predictability of the plains, shifting in impossible curves following the contours of the landscape. And over millennia, the river has carved its course deeply into the hills, virtually invisible until you reach the end of the floodplain. The river is crucially important. Its reliable flow sustains the plants and animals living along its banks, and in this land of scarce water, it is the anchor of life. The milk meanders through post-glacial lands, and a quick scramble up the bips, here's the meander, okay, so you can see basically that the river provides a green um, belt, if you will, across what are otherwise rather um, tonal landscapes. And the river was described by Lewis and Clark, who encountered it and wrote about it in 19, or 1803. Five. Um, they described it as a, having a particular whiteness, which is why they named it uh, the milk. On the edge of its floodplain, you see that these rich alluvial bottoms actually will stretch for over a half a mile and give way to rippling benches that we've seen a couple of pictures of, uh, a few hundred feet in height, which then even out onto the Flaxville Plain and head up to Canada, uh, where Stegner grew up. The first known description of the milk still fits. It is deep, gentle, and has a large quantity of water. Oops. Um, its bed is principally of mud, the banks abrupt, and about 12 feet in height, and it's formed of a dark, rich loam of blue clay. Low grounds near it are wide and fertile, and they possess a considerable portion of cottonwood and willow. And cottonwood is the dominant species along uh, these riverbanks. The land surrounding the milk consists of a shale-derived gumbo soil, which, when wet, forms an impossibly sticky mud. The lumpy riverbanks grab your boots, loath to let go, not a quicksand so much as a wet cement, perfect for the mud daubers who craft earthen nests out of this mixture, but not so great for people driving in cars on the gravel roads. Grasses nourished by these topsoils thrive on the pulverized rock matter, decomposing plant growth and ma massive root networks that bear witness to this climactic pattern. Even today, the pastures of this region resemble the plant associations that characterized the landscape before Euro-American settlement. 
And this is one of the most intact areas of mid-grass prairie landscape on the Great Plains. So you can travel to Montana and remember primarily the shimmer of the cottonwoods along the, uh, the fall river banks and speckling the hills. You can remember the rocks and the grasses. You can remember the effect of these benches, basically, that, uh, that rise out of the river valley, but forget some of the keystone species that keep this ecosystem functioning. And so in my work on the role of local, very local environments in shaping the experiences of homesteaders, I have to insist that we not only uh, acknowledge the role of these keystone species, but that we foreground one of the smaller and longest standing inhabitants of the plains. And I want to remind us all of what Wallace Stegner once wrote, which was that as memory and as experience, these plains are unforgettable even though as history they had the explosiveness of a prairie fire, quickly dangerous and swiftly over. And so here is a 1911 photograph of, a, of an ice house actually against these benches. But here, as I talked about, uh, I, I mentioned this larger project that seeks to, to basically capture these moments of transition um, in the evolution of American land policy. So homesteading essentially offered initially 160 acres of free land to anybody who was willing, anybody citizen or declared or, or non-citizen with an intended citizenship application. Men or women, African Americans, Mexican Americans, freed slaves, uh, immigrants, basically anybody who was the head of a household was entitled to claim one of these uh, farms provided that they did the work of proving it up. Now this graph shows the successful people, basically the number of homesteaders who were able to over the course of five years prove to the federal government that they had achieved the, uh, the, their promise. And about 45 to 50 percent of other homestead claimants did not make it um, through those five years. And then, of course, these are boom and bust cycles. And so you see people in the early 20th century basically building their shacks and plowing their lands and trying to make a go of it. But then most of those places end up looking like this, consolidated into large ranches, um, turned back to the federal government during the 1930s, or basically uh, encompassed within wildlife refuges or private hunting uh, grounds. And so this is actually uh, the farm barn of the family who had um, tried to seize Lily Stern's claim. Um, so it's about uh, a quarter of a mile away from my 640 acre section, but it's awfully close. And that family then moved on to her farm uh, over the course of uh, the following decades. That's a story for another day. But ultimately, this landscape now is a landscape of ranches. It looks with, a, with the exception of the fields and rusted out, or the, uh, the fences and the rusted out cars, it looks a lot like it would have looked back in 1800 when Lewis and Clark passed through. And yet there is this incredible landscape of, this relic landscape of places that have been left behind. And this is actually not, um, there's no like distortion. These are actually buildings that are, are truly falling on their sides. And these places have essentially been partially reclaimed by the forces that they initially intended to um, dominate. So thank you for your time, and uh, I look forward to your questions, both in terms of situating uh, this bee's eye view and the larger project, but also um, asking me about the bees, because this is very much a work in progress. Thank you. Mm -hmm.